Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, normally, I do a 90-minute presentation, and it is a challenge for me to communicate what it is I do in 15 minutes or less, but I'm going to give it a good shot. I am a psychologist by profession. I, I do a presentation on how to get and stay focused on your goals, uh, which I think is an important thing to do. And I'll give you an example as to why. I think right now, human attention spans are being decimated straight down the line. Uh, I see my kids having shorter attention spans. I see people when I converse with them. Uh, just in the space of the last few years, you see it's becoming more and more and more difficult for people to get and stay focused. There are certainly dozens of ways I can illustrate it, but let me start with the simplest. New Year's resolutions are by far the best example of people who cannot stay focused long enough to reach a goal. You see, I think it's easy to get motivated. Getting motivated is quite easy. I think it's hard to stay motivated. What's the most common New Year's resolution in America? 10 pounds, right? Millions of people wake up on January 1st, make a promise to themselves, I'm going to lose this weight and keep it off. And so you ask them, that's a great goal. What's your motivation? Why do you want to lose the weight? And without hesitation, they'll give you a long list. Uh, I'll look better, feel better, wear clothes I haven't worn in years, be proud of myself, be healthier. I mean, these people are full of motivation. And yet you go back to that same person, a day or two later, they're sitting at their desk eating a cookie or dipping into a bag of chips, and what about your diet? And they'll say, not today. You see what's going on around here? It's just been nuts. It's not hard to get motivated. For most people, it's hard to stay motivated. So I try to teach a series of simple techniques that people can do to increase their attention span and their ability to get and stay focused. And as I mentioned, it's just really hit home. I've been on this rant for the last few months uh, about the rate of change that we are living through. As human beings, we've never, as humans, lived through a rate of change that we are living through right now every time you turn around. Something is just totally upended and completely altered. Take a look just at the last 30 days. I mean, a little over 30 days ago, uh, they discovered evidence for the Higgs boson out at the Large Haljong Collider out in Europe. And I know most of you don't, don't know what that means, but that's a big deal. That is the end of a 130-year search for what's called the standard model of particle physics, and they found it 30 days ago. And two weeks ago, they landed Curiosity on Mars. We now got you know, a one-ton rover running around on nuclear power is going to be up there for five or six years. They're looking for life up there. What's going to happen if they actually find the evidence that life existed at one time on Mars? How's that going to change the way people behave and the way people think? We're going through a period of change that is unprecedented in human experience. And I can go down the line, dozens and dozens of examples, but I, I like to use this as a metaphor for change. <laughs> the smartphone. Let me give you an example of what I mean by metaphor for change. If you don't mind me asking, how many of you in this room actually own a smartphone of some brand or form? Now, just take a look around you. There's got to be almost everyone, well over 90% of you folks, are, are reporting that you own a smartphone. Do any of you remember when this little device was introduced, when it was invented? Do any of you remember? 2007, five years ago. Now, think about that. Five years ago, absolutely no one owned a smartphone because they'd never been marketed. Five years later, you're all using smartphones. And how has this changed the way you do business? Now, I know for me, this thing's changed the way I do business about a dozen different ways. First of all, it's now my time manager. I mean, I, this is a Siri model. I press a button, remind me for a conference call at 2 o'clock, wake me up tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. I mean, I don't even write it down anymore. This thing's got a GPS in it. You know, I used to, when I first started in this business, have to call people for directions if I was going to speak at the Iowa Conference Center. And then we segued into the GPSs, but for years, I used to carry around a little Garmin GPS, stick it up on the windshield, sit there and type in the address, and it would direct me. I don't even do that anymore. I land in an airport, I press a button, get me to the Marriott in Des Moines. I just talk into it, and it gives me directions. Now, there, the, there's a, a result of that. A result of doing that is about half the time I have absolutely no idea where I am. I no longer even think about north, south, east, and west anymore because I don't have to. The machine is doing that for me. Isn't that true? These machines have changed our lives in thousands of ways, and they're changing our thinking. It all happened about 40 years ago when we made a major change as a species. We went from analog to digital. Turns out you can do calculations about 100,000 times faster digitally than you'll ever be able to do them analog. And that's when everything started taking off. All of a sudden, everybody had a digital calculator. And then it was the cell phones. And then it was, uh, what do you call it, desktop computers. And everybody had laptops. And then, every, I mean, it's just one right after the other in an instant. We all zoomed up to this digital way of processing information. Now, what's the heart of a computer called? 
called a processor. Guess what they've subtracted from our human thinking? The process. And I'll give you a couple of quick examples. I'm talking about, you know, everybody in here reports having a, s a smartphone or a cell phone. Every single one of these smartphones has on them a calculator. And as I mentioned, one of the first changes you saw back in the 70s and 80s, once we went digital, was everybody had a digital calculator. Everyone had one, and then all of a sudden it morphed into the desktop computers and all that jazz. So here's one of the changes that have happened since all of us having these digital pieces of equipment. I've got a little test for you. Sometime in the next 24 hours, invent a six-digit number. Make up any six-digit number you wish, 842,692. And then divide that six-digit number by 14, longhand. First of all, see if you can still do it. Second, see how long it takes you. And third, see how many mistakes you make. None of us do longhand calculations anymore because the machines took that away from us. That's the process. But when we used to do the longhand calculations, draw the little box, take your numbers, carry your four and all that, when you brought it down, you saw a process. Here's the question, here's the answer, and here's how we got there. And that is what is being subtracted from human thinking as we become more and more reliant on these devices. I, everywhere I turn, I see an article about this. There's a new thing now. They call it the, the smartphone walk, the smartphone gate, when people are walking down staring at their smartphone. The number of accidents people are having, they get so absorbed in their smartphones, they walk out into traffic now. They're walking in tel telephone poles. Apparently, that's gone up 400% just in the last year. We are starting to talk like computers, LOL, BRB, abbreviating everything, the tweet. You know, take a complete thought and condense it to 140 characters. Now, the net result of that, as I mentioned, is it had decimated human attention spans. Don't know how many of you paid attention or noticed, but about 10 years ago, they dropped the 60-second commercial. There are no more 60-second commercials because people can't concentrate for 60 seconds anymore. People cannot pay attention for something for 60 seconds. Their brain is going over, all over the place. And it was about the mid-80s, I guess, as more and more people started using computers. It was the first time I heard the term multitasking. Remember that term? Multitasking. What are you doing? Well, I'm thinking of five things at once. Well, I'm a psychologist. I'm here to tell you, you cannot do that. You can only process one stream of information at a time. Here's what you can do. You can take a period of time and bounce your attention all over so it seems like you're thinking of five things at once. But in fact, at any given time, you're processing one stream of information. The net result of multitasking is that all of those tasks tend to get degraded. Again, everywhere I look, I see evidence of it. Just a few weeks ago on public television, they had a frontline program. Don't know if any of you watched this program or not, but it was titled Digital Nation. And it was addressing some of the things I've been talking about for the last couple of years. And, and one of the things was they were talking about anybody born after 1980 has been born into the digital age. I mean, they're all digital. And when they talk to these students, they've all got laptops, they've all got smartphones, they've all got their digital you know, iPods and all that jazz. And they showed a picture of a physics professor in one of the lecture halls trying to teach them physics. And every single one of them has got a laptop. And they interviewed the professor, and he says, yeah, I know what's going on. That one over there is on Facebook. That one over there is chatting with their friend. That one on there is watching porn. I know what's going on. I'm talking to them. You know? And then they interview the students. And the students say, I am a master at multitasking. You know, I, I can do two things at once. No one had ever tested this before. So in this program, they had a professor that set up a series of tests, cognitive tests. You think you can do two things at once, you know, and it doesn't degrade the one to the other. He tested, and every student he tested, and every test he designed, every student, saw a degradation in their performance because they were multitasking. Their attention spans were being destroyed, and they're not even aware of it. Now, this is not the first time this has happened. In my generation, we had something similar, you know. I can smoke a joint and still drive to Florida. You know, better, I, I drive better when I'm stoned. So they would set up an obstacle course, you know? Here, smoke a joint and don't hit those orange cones. And the people would be knocking down all the cones, you know what I mean? Jeez, I was smart and I was driving better. And the generation before that, it was alcohol. You know, I, alcohol makes me drive better. It doesn't affect my driving performance. Anytime you're doing two things at once, your performance is being degraded. So that's the problem, I think, is that people's attention spans are simply being decimated. I can give you hundreds of examples. The question is, what's the solution? So what I try to show people in my presentations are simple, hands-on techniques. For example, these are all programmable. You can program these things to remind you, or buzz, or chime, or vibrate, let's say every half hour. Well, you want an interesting experiment? I recommend you do that. I recommend you take your smartphone and program it to buzz every half hour, and keep the thing in your purse or your pocket, and for the next few hours, every half hour that you hear that thing or feel that thing vibrating, stop for just a minute what you're doing and ask yourself, what is going on inside my head right now? 
what am I thinking right now? And here's what you're likely to discover. You're likely to discover you're spending a huge part of your waking day thinking about what you should have done, could have done, might have done, what you think you're going to do, what you hope you're going to do, and you're not paying attention to what you're actually doing. Again, the more we use these devices, there is a side effect to them. And I'll give you another example. Simply try to remember how you got to work last time you drove to work. I'm going to presume most of you work in an office and drive to work. may or may not be correct. But if you do, try to remember the last drive you took to work. Now, if that drive took you 15 minutes, I wager most of you are going to have trouble remembering any more than three or four out of those 15 minutes. Question is, where were you the rest of the time? Well, you had your head up in the clouds. You were probably paying with one of these devices, listening to a CD, wondering what you were going to do, and not what you were actually doing. This fragmented style of thinking, I call it thinking in frozen instants in time. Try to reconstruct the last time you went to work or drove to work. You're going to be lucky if you remember two or three minutes, and here are the two or three you're going to remember. The jerk that cut you off on the freeway, that made you conscious. Trying to find a parking space. The long red light, you'll remember that. You're not going to remember the rest. These things put your head up in the clouds, and not coincidentally, what's the next generation of computing already been called? It's called cloud computing, folks. That's where it's going. Now, I'm making it sound like a negative thing. It's not a negative thing. I think the digital age is wonderful. I love these toys. I think they have pushed us forward at a rapid pace. But many of the people I speak to are involved in a profession that requires exactly the opposite type of thinking. When I deal with salespeople, especially people in financial services, your job is to sit there face to face and give that client 100% of your attention. And you can't do it anymore, can you? You go in there and your mind's racing about what you're going to do, what you think you're going to do. You don't think people notice that? I do. If I'm talking to someone on the phone, I can tell if they're playing on their computer or fancying around with their cell phone. You don't think the clients you deal with can tell if they've got 100% of your attention or not? So what I try to show people is, it's fine to multitask, and it's great to get you know, as much done as you can, but there are some times when you want to shut it all down and do nothing but focus. Now, here's the good news. It is not hard to get focused. I maintain you were born focused. Take a look at a five-year-old or a six-year-old. They don't have any trouble putting 100% of their attention in a single spot. You were born focused. You're scatterbrained now because of the culture we happen to live in. I try to teach people a series of examples or techniques. One technique is, you know, take this device and record your goals. And then either burn it to CD or put it on your iPod. And every day for the next couple of weeks, as you're driving around your car, at least once a day, just hear your goals droning in the background. Spaced repetition. Same net psychological effect as television commercials. Most people think they can't be conditioned. You're conditioned regularly. Here are some examples. Please don't squeeze. Fly the friendly skies up. You're in good hands with. Now you snap back with those answers. Did any of you try to learn that stuff? Did any of you want to learn it? Are you ever going to be able to forget it? You got so much junk in your head, it's unbelievable. And it gets in there just by picking it up in the background. I got two little girls at home. How many of you have young children? Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? Now how'd you learn that? You know, I hate SpongeBob. I do. I hate the cartoon. The whole thing drives me nuts. But I know that song by heart because it drones in the background every afternoon when the girls are watching it. So get your goals down on one of these devices or a CD, and as you're driving around once a day for five minutes, just hear your voice droning in the background. It's the basis of all modern advertising, and obviously it has an effect on you, or advertisers would not be spending billions of dollars a year doing it to your brain, would they? So that's one thing you can do. Space repetition auditorily. There are a variety of others. A number of you in this room have, have come up to me and, and asked me, are you going to hypnotize anybody today? Because one of the things that I do in my presentations that's really dramatic, to illustrate the point, is I'll bring five or six or eight people up on stage, literally hypnotize them, to show them another way of getting focused. Why in the world would you hypnotize people? Because it's a simple, easy to learn, effective way of getting and staying focused. Call it whatever you like, visual imagery, creative visualization, there's all kinds of fancy names for it. It's self-hypnosis. Don't let the word scare you. Turns out the average person in this room is already spending about 70% of their waking day in a trance anyhow. <laughs> I'm just going to try to help you put it to some good use. So I bring people up and I show them as part of my presentation, and this is where the laughter comes in. This is where the people, I cannot believe what I just saw. You, know, you have not lived until you see one of your team members talking into their shoe. It's, it's, it's really, 
an interesting, fascinating thing. And when we did this presentation, when we talked about doing this showcase, you know, we, we had a problem. I simply cannot, in 15 minutes, bring people up, hypnotize them, and do anything to make it work. So I've tried to come up with a solution to that. In your bags, you all should have one of these. There are two DVDs in this binder. One DVD is my standard, pay $20,000 for it with all the bells and whistles, demo DVD with all kinds of cuts from things I do all over the world and all over the presentations. If you want the fancy version, that's this. But the other day I sat down and took a very recent presentation that I did for um, Edwards. Why can I not remember his name? Uh, A. E. No, not A.G. Edwards. That's awful. Anyhow, I, a presentation I did in St. Louis in front of a group about Edward Jones. I am so sorry, that's so embarrassing. I did the Edward Jones annual meeting in St. Louis, and I also did it in Phoenix, Arizona for them. And uh, the cut was very good, so it's uncut. This is, if you want to see what my presentation is about, how I can blend a very serious message with the fun part that's the hypnosis. The second CD has two tracks on it. First track is the talk part, where I teach them how to do the techniques. The second part is where I bring people up out of the audience and hypnotize them. It was done less than 90 days ago. It is completely unfiltered and unedited and uncut. Very, very recent. So if you want to see how it would apply to what you folks are doing or how it could be used in one of your presentations, I would urge you to take a look at this. Also, we've got some CDs, we're going to be, or CDs that we're going to give you during the lunch break. But my time is down to one second, and I'm up, and I want to thank you guys. I hope I communicate at least some of what I do in 15 minutes or less. Good luck to all of you. Have a great conference.